Hey there. Um, okay, so normally I would not want to cover a work as important of, as Augustus of Prima Porta via video lecture, but since we basically don't have class this week uh, and many of you are out, um, we need to keep moving along, so here you go. Um, Augustus of Prima Porta, we have a, a little bit larger than life-size marble statue uh, made during Augustus's life, okay? Um, remember that one of our key ideas about Roman art is that much of it is imperial propaganda, okay? Glorifying the emperor, spreading uh, his message, and so forth, okay? Um, Augustus uh, is the first emperor and begins this uh, period known as Pax Romana, or Roman peace, okay? Um, essentially, this is a, uh, a major political departure, okay? Um, we have now one man who is um, more or less consolidating all the power underneath himself uh, or in himself, even though uh, the Senate still exists, but it's basically there as a, uh, uh, a shell of what it once was. So Augustus needs a major propaganda campaign. He needs propaganda to convince Romans that, um, that they should not be worried about um, his new powers, uh, and that uh, also that this idea of um, Roman peace is a good thing. And I know that sounds really counterintuitive, but um, prior to this, Rome was basically always in a state of civil war and war with the barbarians uh, outside of the empire or outside of the republic that they were trying to conquer. Okay, so that was normal life for Romans. Um, really, uh, prior to Augustus, the idea of peace was really something that would only um, could only happen after you had beaten your enemies into submission. Okay, that was the only reason to have peace, and that's not what happened during the reign of Augustus. Um, he basically just decided to uh, scale back the conflicts. Um, and slow down the expansion of the empire. So R Pax Romana is not true peace. Uh, you know, Augustus was still continually involved in wars in the region, um, but compared to what came before, it was a, a sense of relative peace and relative expansion. And most importantly, it is a new way for the, for the Romans to live. And this is what um, Augustus needs to convince uh, the Romans that this is a good thing. Okay. So this particular uh, marble statue here was found in Augustus's wife, uh, in Augustus's wife Livia's villa. Okay, but it is one of many. Um, the original would have been a bronze, but then numerous marble copies were made and disseminated throughout the Roman Empire. Okay. You have to keep in mind that this is before the age of mass media, okay? And the Roman Empire was vast. M most people who lived in this empire would never set eyes on the man who was their leader, who was supposed to be their leader, okay? So these Roman portraits, portraits, uh, these imperial portraits, would communicate that message. In a way, they are mass media during a time before mass, te mass uh, telecommunications and whatnot, okay? This is what would let uh, people know what their leader looked like, even if it is not an actual likeness, which is the case here, okay? Um, there were numerous uh, depictions of Augustus. If you get on the internet, you'll see a lot. Um, you'll see Augustus as a general. Um, you'll see him as Pontifex Maximus, which I think I showed you the other day. Uh, Augustus on horseback. Um, a heroic nude warrior Augustus, and then him imitating Jupiter or Mars, the god of war, okay? There's something somewhat, um, from a contemporary standpoint, something somewhat uh, absurd about this. Can you imagine if uh, we had uh, depictions of the president of the United States as a uh, heroic nude warrior, or even more offensive, imitating uh, the contemporary gods, uh, Barack Obama as Christ. I mean, it becomes incredibly offensive from a contemporary standpoint. Uh, but during the early Roman Republic, uh, it's kind of commonplace. 
Okay. Most importantly, this is, um, and, and this is a slippery uh, distinction here, but Augustus of Prima Porta, and in fact all portraits of Augustus and the following uh, emperors of the Julio-Claudian dynasty are not um, portraits in the strictest sense. They are likenesses. And what I mean by this is um, the portraits do bear specific resemblance to the actual people, Augustus, Trajan, Hadrian, and so forth, but they are idealized at the same time, okay? Um, I'll get back to that idea in a second. Here we have on the right Augustus as Jupiter with an actual, uh, I believe this, I'm not sure if this is Greek or Roman, um, but a, an actual similar depiction of Jupiter here. Okay. Let's move this out of the way. So, back to the idea that this is not a portrait in the strictest sense. Okay? Augustus rules for 40 years, living to be a very old man, 76 years old. But you will never find a portrait of him that looks much different from this one here, where he is young, in the peak of physical condition. I mean, look at his arms. I mean, this is a guy who is strong, in shape, and whatnot. Was uh, Augustus quite so fit, quite so handsome? We can never know. Um, but um, this may sound somewhat familiar to you. Uh, it sounds a bit like Greek sculpture, doesn't it? Okay? So what we have here, starting with Augustus, is a departure from the tradition of Roman verism. Okay? Um, and what he is doing here is showing uh, himself in an idealized way, the way he wants to be seen and remembered. Perhaps it's what he looked like when he was, when he became Augustus, the venerated one, uh, when he became emperor. Um, but perhaps there's also um, an element here where it's showing him as strong, as youthful, as virile, as powerful, and in a way, as a Greek. Okay? So, portraiture under the Julio-Claudian dynasty, which is the, um, the dynasty that begins with uh, Augustus here, it merges that classical Greek idealism with Roman verism or Roman naturalism, okay? So, we get recognizable features. We can tell what Augustus looks like. Um, he has specific features when we see Trajan and Hadrian, some of his... Uh, followers, we will see um, similar um, kinds of qualities or, or similar uh, specific traits, um, yet they are idealized at the same time. So they are a blend. Okay, it's important to understand that at this point in time, the Romans um, were the greatest empire perhaps that had ever existed, um, yet they saw Greek culture as being the great, the superior culture. Okay, they still saw 5th century Athens as the golden age, the peak of civilization. So Augustus is doing something very deliberate here. He is ushering in a new era, a new political era, a new era in which power is consolidated under one man who is the son of a god, the divine Julius Caesar, um, who descended from Venus. Um, and um, so he, he's embarking on new changes in uh, ushering in a new era of Pax Romana. And so, in a way, he is saying, I'm establishing the new Athens, okay? The new golden age is now, and I am the, the leader of it. I'm the, I'm the one responsible for it. And so he lays that uh, another layer of Greek culture as symbol on top of his imperial propaganda. All right, the sculpture, while I wouldn't expect you to necessarily pick this up by looking at it, um, Augustus uh, employed the canon of polycleitos, okay? So we get um, those exact proportions that we found in the Deriferos sculpture. Um, we know from writing that um, Augustus and the Romans in general really admired um, polycleitos. They considered him one of the greatest uh, Greek sculptors. Um, and here you can get a good sense of what Augustus looks like, okay? He has these kind of somewhat flared out large ears uh, and uh, somewhat of a squarish head, but all in all, a pretty um, handsome guy. 
All right. Over here on the left, we have a um, ancestor bust of Mr. McGee. Um, just kidding, but everybody says that um, that this looks like McGee. This is actually Julius Caesar. Okay. So um, it's important to keep in mind. Um, Time can become somewhat confusing uh, in this class since we only look at a few sculptures uh, that span hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but since the founding of the Roman Republic, Roman sculpture looked more or less like this. You saw signs of age, you know, furrowed, bra furrowed brows, wrinkles, and whatnot. And that goes on for 500 years, a very long time. And then suddenly, abruptly, Augustus changes uh, the direction of Roman po imperial portraiture, and it starts looking like this, something out of um, ancient Greece. This is significant. Romans would have understood this. They were very familiar with Greek art. Um, they had a lot of it in Rome that they looted from Greece, which was now under their domain. Okay, so what we have here again, political departure uh, accompanied by an artistic departure. This should sound very familiar to you guys. It's right out of the textbook of Akhenaten, okay? Um, while Augustus was not implementing an entirely new uh, religion uh, in the way that Akhenaten did, uh, in a way, he, he was inching down that territory. I mean, starting with Augustus, we get the rise of the imperial cult, the cult of the emperors, okay? His, uh, uh, Augustus's adopted father, Julius Caesar, was now revered as the divine Julius, the god Julius. And um, while the classic gods of Mount Olympus are still revered um, really up into and through the rise of Christianity, the rise of the imperial cult is the beginning of the end for the, um, the belief in those gods. Um, and the, the cult of the emperors starts to become more real, more revered in the Roman Empire. All right, let's move this again, this pesky box. Okay, so, um, also, beginning with Augustus of Prima Porta, we get the establishment of standards that, uh, artistic standards that Roman emperors are going to use for centuries, okay? First, we get this pose that he is standing in, which we call the orator pose. You know, these kinds of statues would often be in public settings where everyday Romans may see them. So we have here the idealized Augustus addressing a crowd perpetually. That's the orator pose, this hand up. Um, often he would they would be holding a, a scroll here. Um, we've lost the object he was actually holding. It may have been a spear. Um, we're not exactly sure. Um, and just as a side note, Look at this example of contraposto we have going on here, once again, out of the canon of Polyclitos. Okay, we're going to get those references to classical Greek art, canon of Polyclitos, fit, youthful depictions, sort of heroic proportions. And it's possible, this may be a stretch, it's possible that even the, the use of marble uh, is in a way a nod to the Greeks, okay? It's not that it starts with the Augustus, the, with Augustus. Romans were using marble before this. But if you think about the dominant culture in their region, the Etruscans, um, who made sculptures out of terracotta, um, it becomes tempting to think that uh, the Romans choose marble because it reminds them of the Greeks. We don't know. It's definitely a, a bit of guesswork here. Um, but it, it can be a little bit of an alluring idea. On the left here, we have um, a sculpture from a century or so later than Augustus. This is the Emperor Trajan. And so you can see that that um, new canon is essentially in full effect um, for quite some time. All right, we're going to go down here to Augustus's bare feet. You can get a nice view of the contraposto, that, that weight planted on firmly on one leg with the bent knee. Um, <laughs> this funny little uh, winged baby down here kind of tugging on Augustus's uh, cloak is Cupid, the son of Venus. Okay, So remember, uh, 
Caesar uh, is said to descend from the bloodline of Venus. So we have that reference to the divine family that Augustus is the adopted son of. Um, on top of that, Augustus is depicted with bare feet. Okay, this is propaganda as well, and it may have multiple functions. Um, previously, deities would be the ones to be depicted barefoot in sculptures. So this may in part be hinting at Augustus's divine nature, um, but not overstating it. I mean, Augustus's uh, adopted father, uh, uh, Julius Caesar, was killed for uh, doing similar things that Augustus is doing consolidating powder power under himself claiming to be divine okay so augustus knows he needs to tread lightly so to speak around um these issues uh so it may be hinting at his divine like status but it also could be a, a reference to pax romana he has taken off his boots he is no longer uh fighting he is at peace just like the roman empire empire so to speak we're going to move on up the sculpture here. Now we're looking at Augustus's uh, breastplate here, where you can see some nice relief sculpture. Okay. What we're seeing here is a victory over barbarians. Okay. If you if you can, can't remember the specific details, just remember it is a Roman victory over barbarians. Okay. In specific, it is a victory uh, uh, Augustus's forces had over the Parthians who were, in all effect, Persians, okay? That long-time thorn in the side of the Greco-Roman uh, cultures. Um, so you can see here, if we look closely, we have a bearded figure here. This is the, the Parthian king, and he's returning a Roman military standard that the Parthians had um, uh, gotten, had stolen from the Romans in a previous fight. So he's returning the standard, to a Roman general here, okay? Um, this is significant. Um, for a Roman military standard to be stolen uh, by an enemy was a great humiliation, okay? And so those, those pesky Persians um, were an enemy that was um, always, uh, you know, a, a thorn in the side of, of the Greeks and of the Romans. And so Augustus here is redeeming a previous hu humiliation, okay? He is, he is avenging a, uh, a defeat at the hands of the Parthians from before, okay? So this idea of Augustus as a redeemer, once again, um, as somebody who is um, healing the previous, the, the, the past wounds of the Romans and so forth. Okay, he really is a kind of savior figure. He casts himself as a kind of savior figure for the Romans. Moving on up here, you can see a sort of cosmological scene. Um, there are some differing opinions about um, what we're looking at up here, but essentially we have a kind of god of the sky. It may be Jupiter, um, or it may be a more of an allegorical figure. He, this is the this cloth he's holding over his head is the night sky, the, the sky of the cosmos and the stars. Um, you know, a, a, a common interpretation of this is that uh, there are sort of cosmic implications to uh, this victory over the Parthians that um, the, that the, the gods want the Romans to rule. They have a sort of manifest destiny to rule the world. And then we move on down to Augustus's belly here. I love this belly button in the in the armor here. Um, but we have a um, sort of an earth goddess down here with a cornucopia. Okay, we, you know you know this symbol of the cornucopia from Thanksgiving holiday and whatnot. Um, it is of course you know also called the horn of plenty. It is a a symbol of um, great harvest, and it essentially means uh, not only do we have peace. Uh, from a military standpoint, but there is a, a great amount of food to eat. We have fertility uh, and so forth. So uh, this armor is really a, a promise of peace and great things to come. And Augustus is the one who's responsible for that. Just while we're in here close, you know, look at how these amazing, like, drapery uh, folds all carved into marble. Um, 
it, you can maybe begin to imagine some of the interesting tools the sculptors would use to get down into these little crevices and carve all that out. Okay, so finally, in summary here, oh, uh, we don't need to talk about that. I think we've already covered what the armor is all about, <laughs> which brings us to this shocking image. Um, sorry, once again, these things, these sculptures were painted, okay? This is one of, uh, there's a couple different um, uh, versions, uh, recreations of what the sculpture would have looked like painted. Um, as we've already talked about, they can be hard to, um, hard to look at this way. There's a sort of cheapness uh, from our contemporary standpoint, but they would have looked something like this during the Roman Empire, which, you know, in a way does give them a more lifelike quality. Okay, what's this here? Uh, okay, um, let's skip that. I think I meant to hide that image. Okay, so um, anyways, Augustus dies in the year 14 CE. Like I said, he's an old man. Um, he, like Julius Caesar, is then deified. Um, he is uh, then... Augustus does not have a, a son of his own, so he is uh, succeeded by his stepson, uh, Livia's son Tiberius from a previous marriage. And this is uh, really the beginning of what's called the Julio-Claudian dynasty, um, meaning the line of Julius Caesar and then Claudius, who was Tiberius's father. Um, this goes on um, for a few more decades, ending with Nero's suicide, uh, if you know about Nero, um, in the year 68 CE. Uh, Anyways, after this, um, all the successive emperors uh, bear the title of uh, Caesar and Augustus. Um, the month Sextilius was renamed August. Um, this is not a lot of stuff you need to really know in regards to the class, but it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, up here we can see um, Augustus being deified uh, upon, his, upon his death. And uh, uh, Athena, I believe this is Athena, and uh, some other deities surrounding them. And that is where we will end this.